So, Monty, I got a chance to meet you briefly uh, maybe two months ago, three months ago, the last podcast I actually did, which was with Michael, brought me up and introduced me to you, but I haven't really had a chance to get to talk to you much. So first time we've had a chance to really sit and chat. I'm curious, first of all, what's this bit, whole process been like? Because you get hired and you're all in. You're going 100 miles an hour. What's it been like personally? What's it been like professionally for you? Well, professionally, the, you know, it all culminated in these last last few days. It was, you know, it was a lot of a lot of work here from a lot of fronts, a lot of people from the scouting department to the coaching staff to trainers and all all facets of football operations contributed to this past weekend. So, it was a nice just ending to just a lot of work that had went in. You know, it's it's been it's been a challenge. You know, the, the when when you have this type of transition, it's a, you're away from your family. Uh, a lot of people are away from their families. Um, you're living in a hotel. You're living in temporary housing. Um, but you know what? It's also it's it also a blessing because you can you can just focus in on the job, and um, you know because there is a lot to do. There's a lot to do when when that transition comes in, and you know there's. Uh, you know, th- there was a lot of things that we wanted to, to focus on with the draft and just getting the right types of people from the all-star game process through the combine and then through our 30 visit process. So that was a, that was a big focus of ours. And, you know, there was a lot of things to juggle, but a lot of people stepped up and a lot of people contributed to, you know, what we hope is a, a, was a winning effort this past weekend. You talked about being away from your family as a dad. You know, how challenging has that been for you? How What's it been like? communicating with your kids who this is probably the first time you've been gone this long yeah it's 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 been it's been a challenge for all of us and you know we we came to a a pretty good routine here over the last couple months where you know I'm I'm a I'm an early morning guy and so on my my drive in Nashville is back on on central time and so on my drive in it was really breakfast time the girls were were getting ready for breakfast for school and so my 15-minute drive in to work was a great time for us just to chat over the phone and, and get connected for, hey, what's going on today and, and what's the plan, anything special at school today. And then, you know, FaceTime has been a lifesaver. That's been great to just connect and see faces. And, you know, but it's, it's been tough. I've, been <clears throat> I've missed, a, missed a few sporting events. Uh, this past weekend, my oldest daughter had, a, had her last volleyball tournament in Birmingham, but you know, thank God, technology. I was able to, to pull up the iPad and, and watch her games. Um, you know, so I could, I wasn't there, but I, I tried to connect as much as possible. So I'm excited, going to take a couple of days and get home to yeah. see them, and, uh, but excited for them to get out here to the Valley and, and call this home. So your daughter's playing volleyball. Is it club volleyball? Is she, so she must be pretty good if she's traveling at pretty young age yeah right? yeah she you know so her her mom uh my wife shannon she uh she was a collegiate volleyball player and um you know the my oldest is is involved in club volleyball and and she's uh she's really enjoyed that so you know i've it's it's been tough missing out on that but you know i know my my wife has been there to, to support her and and uh to help her out my wife actually coached her school team this past year um at uh, at our school and so you know but my wife took a step back for the club season and sure. uh but that's been great you were an athlete too. You played quarterback, Minnesota Morris, which is where. And I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, and I don't know where Minnesota sure, Morris sure. is. Sure, so. yeah, allegedly an athlete. I would say that. <laughs> uh, no, uh, Morris is in the middle of nowhere. It's in uh, about as far west part of the state of Minnesota, but right in the middle, so west central Minnesota. Tiny little town. It's a tiny school. Uh, when I when I was there, we were a Division two school. They've since dropped down to Division three. Um, but you know, hey, we had a lot of fun, met a lot of friends there. We 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 weren't a good team. We uh, that's kind of an insult to 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 say we were a bad team to bad team. So uh, <laughs> we uh, but we had a lot of fun and we we worked hard and uh, it, it was it was a good experience for me. And, and so and I'm trying to find information about you uh, other than you know what's obviously been out there and. Uh, through either the Cardinals or the Titans or going back to the Patriots. And one thing I, I caught on Wikipedia, and I always have to ask because Wikipedia is the worst. There's been <laughs> things on me that are that are not correct on Wikipedia that I've had to tell people, like, hey, that's not true. Um, so you were a radio show host in college? Is that <laughs> is that accurate? Man, this did is... You th- is that true? And did you... Th- Think you're about di- going into broadcasting. You're digging deep here. Okay, oh, yeah. you're digging deep. Um, <laughs> no, nah, so at, at my at, at our tiny little school, there was a student-run radio station that I, you know, I'm not sure that the uh, the signal went out much further than the uh, the four the four blocks of campus. But uh, yeah, there was a Saturday. I can't remember. No, I think it was a Sunday morning show for two hours that you know you just fill blocks of time, and so 
you know, me and a couple buddies, we were screwing around and, uh, you know, hey, well, this would be cool. And, you know, I think it lasted for a few months, but I, I think they <laughs> ran us off. I don't think listenership was real high. So so broadcasting was not going to be part of your future. Nah, I got out of that yeah. quick. Yeah. But scouting was. What? What? When did you make the choice to go down this road, knowing, you know, how hard it is to work your way up? You're already... You talked about being away from your family now, but that's something as a scout traveling over the years you've learned to get used to. What made you decide to go this route in terms of staying involved in football? Yeah, when my when my playing career was over, I, I kind of was at a little bit of a crossroads, didn't quite know where I was going to go, and thought about going in the coaching coaching realm. And um, you know, it's something always about personnel. The personnel I'd always. Um, was interested in the draft and kind of when I was young reading up on on personnel moves and trades and things like that and and so you know I didn't didn't think coaching was was the right path for me and and so I decided hey this is this is an avenue that I, I kind of wanted to go try going down and and so when I when I left uh, undergrad undergraduate at, at from Morris uh, decided to go to graduate school at Ohio University for a couple years and and they have a sports administration program there and oh, so yeah. Went there for a couple years, and, and through through the connections from Ohio University, I was able to land a, an internship. Um, my first job in the NFL down, you know, actually, first I had a training camp internship with the Minnesota Vikings, um, hauling mattresses around a dorm room, installing window air conditioning units, uh, you know, real glorious stuff. <laughs> and uh, so that was my first exposure to the NFL. And then after my two years in Ohio, um, found a, a year-long internship down in Houston with the Texans in personnel. And and at that point, I was hooked and, and just had a, a real fortunate along the way to, to meet some great people and learn and, and to have a bunch of things break my way for me to um, kind of just move up the ranks. Was Mike Tice the head coach of the Vikings? Then it wasn't Denny, was it? Uh, it was. Man, that's a great question. At that point, it was. I want what to, year was it? It was 2001. I, th- I think it might have still been Denny. I, I think it was. I look. think it was Denny. Okay. It was. Uh, it was Moss's rookie year. Yeah, yeah. It was Moss. That was Denny then. Oh yeah, yeah. it was Denny. It was. It was actually. Uh, unfortunately, it was. The, it was the summer that that Corey Stringer passed away. Oh wow. Yeah, it was that. Then that was a, that was a tough, oh, uh, yeah. tough situation there in Mankato yeah. where we had training camps. So that was that was the year. Yeah. And so you, you were at the Patriots obviously for a long time. Most recently with the Titans, but 15 years overall in New England. Uh, what was your biggest? takeaway when you look back and think hey this was something that I held on to that I learned from coach Belichick or one of the many other personnel guys who've gone on to be GMs like Jason Light yeah boy we could be here for two hours <laughs> talking about that because uh you know I just extremely fortunate to to have that experience of being there but you know I think I think the biggest thing for me is just taken from there is just the importance of building an entire football program that there's nothing that can stand alone and, and be on its own. Everything is connected, whether it's the coaching or the scouting, but even to the strength training, to training, to nutrition, to uh, how the team travels, to you know the, the PR group. Everything is, every, everything is on the same page. Everything is pointed in one direction, and that's to winning. And so, you know, that's that's something out there's there's really no no secret sauce everybody always brings up oh the patriot way and and there's some you know magical formula or some secret pill like th- there really isn't other than you know people knowing what their job is and how they contribute to a winning effort and doing it at a high level do you have any particular interactions with coach Belichick that you recall i don't know if you've had a chance to get to know Ron Wolfley at all who i do the cardinal games with with Wolf was the special teams captain for Bill in Cleveland and still talks to him. Like, they still have a relationship. He's had him on his radio show, and he's got great stories that really tell you all you need to know, that basically Bill hasn't changed. Like, he's the same now as he was then in terms of how he interacts with players, how he interacts with people on his staff. Is there anything that you recall, like, man, that was a great conversation or one that was, like, embarrassing where he ripped you or something? <laughs> Well, I mean, I you know, I'd say I'd say this. I mean, Coach Belichick is um, he, he's he's always been um, you know he's been a person that I've learned an, an immense amount from, and you know he's been extremely generous with his time here since I, since I I got this job, um, just being a sounding board for me and and just being being there to to talk through some things with, and he's he's been tremendous with that. You know, I, I think my first uh, when I was a um, lower level scout in New England. Um, one year we were prepping for the draft and 
And at the time, I was living in Colorado, so I wasn't even in the office. But you know, I, I had had I had a project to do, and um, for some reason, I, I got on a project of of looking at um, special teams players for the draft. And so, you know, there was a there was a it was the year that Matt Slater was coming out of UCLA, and so Matt Slater was one of the guys that I happened to look at, and um, you know, I, I looked at. 10, 12, 10, 12 players, and um, you know Matt Matt Slater stood out as just a guy that an out, outstanding special teams player. And so, you know, I as a lower level scout, you didn't have a lot of interaction with Coach Belichick. And so, you know, I completed this project and and sent it in, and and um, you know passed it up to to Scott Pioli, to Nick Casario, some guys that I had worked for. And um, you know, I woke up one morning with the time change in Colorado, and you know, I checked my phone and. Um, uh, I had an email from Coach Belichick and like, you know, kind of groggy to snap up and like, oh, I got, I, I got to read this one, you know. So it was, uh, it was, it was Coach Belichick and it was him, him asking me about the project that I did and specifically about Matt. And so, you know, that's something that that really was my first like real direct interaction with Coach Belichick on a, on a one to one basis and just you know that he had taken the time to to read what I had had, had put before him. Um, you know, that, that was kind of a, a something that's always going to stick with me. I, I remember watching, I think it was called The Two Bills. It was a 30 for 30 with him and Bill Parcells. And watching Coach Belichick's reverence for Coach Parcells. And again, hearing from Wolf, other guys that played for Bill, I, I know it's all business with him. But at the same time, like, I feel that he respects and appreciates guys that went to war for him, whether it was a player or somebody in your position. Is that something that you found as well? Absolutely. I think, I think that's absolutely fair. I mean, Bill is, Bill is an extremely focused individual, and he is focused on, he's focused on winning and, and doing what's best for the football team. And I think when he sees, he sees you know, other people, he, I mean, that's his goal is to surround uh, the rest of his organization with people that have that same mindset. And he has a real appreciation for, for people that can, can really put the team before themselves. So you talked uh, after the draft in your press conference about the rush of everything you did. <laughs> and I'm curious because you know we're not in that room. We have no idea what it's like to be in that room. What was it like to be the GM on draft night? You've been in the rooms before, but you've not been that guy making all the calls, having the final say. What was it like? It was different. <laughs> it was certainly different. You know, I'm... I think that that kind of dawned on me um, in the in the couple days leading up to the draft, and you know, in the in the past, you prepare for a draft, and you're like, man, uh, you know, I, I hope this happens, and I, you know, I, you know, if this happens, I I think we should do this, but now it's there's no more. I think we should do this. It's we're going to do this, and you know, also that's that's uh, you know that's a that's a big mantle to to take on, you know, and so you know that that uh, that's something that I did you know think about. It did cross my mind going in, but. You know, I think for me personally, like I think the the thing that really helped me um, over that that first hour of the draft, where there was there was so much action, is is we were prepared, and the the team, our our group of individuals upstairs, we we were we were ready, and you know it, it could have things could have shook out a different way, and we would have been fine. We would have been fine with that too. I just I just think that the the time that we prepared and the scenarios that we tried to walk through. Um, you know, things didn't happen exactly the way we thought they would, but we had also talked ad nauseum about different ways that things could happen, and we were ready, we reacted, and, you know, ultimately I think, I think we made decisions that were good for the team. How much of what you're talking about right now in terms of things didn't go exactly how we thought or we weren't sure what was going to happen, it felt like the world wasn't sure based on you – know, it just seemed like everything was coming down to number two. Like, I kept hearing – they don't like C.J. Stroud in Houston, and it clearly was subterfuge, right? It clearly was put out there. Were you guys hearing that as well? Like, were you guys unsure, hey, is it going to be Stroud? Is it going to be Will Anderson? Are they going to look to trade down? Is it going to be somebody else? Yeah, and I think we looked at all those scenarios, Dave. I think, you know, we, we didn't. We had no idea. We had no idea. I mean, we felt, we felt pretty good about what was going to happen at one. Um, number two, we had no idea. So we had to talk about all those scenarios that you just said. We, we, hey, if they take – this quarterback or a different quarterback or do they go a position player and we had to talk through all those scenarios about who may or may not be interested in moving up based on what happened at number two so we worked through those and 
you know, you could drive yourself crazy going going with uh, you, there's a million different scenarios and you, you know, well, well, what if this happens? Well, that would never happen. Well, oh, really? Like you, you just don't know with a draft, you know. So um, we work through those and, and we we felt good about, you know, just working through those different scenarios. And, and we were surprised as ever as anybody when when number two came off the board. OK, so number two comes off the board. Is it right away? Okay, we've worked through these scenarios. So scenario X has happened. Let's execute that plan. Correct. And I think, you know, I think I think the discussions on on this the the number three pick they really they really started back at the combine. And you know, hey, you know, I, at that point it was more. I don't know if we're going to pick at number three, but if we don't pick, or would you be interested in coming up? So you know, we started those conversations back then. Uh, and then I would say the week leading up to the draft and specifically the, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday before the draft, those talks really started to get more concrete. And so it was a goal of mine is to have – I wanted to go into Thursday with parameters of what was going to happen so that no matter what happened at number two, I didn't want a cold call to come out of the blue at number three and us start from ground zero. So we had multiple teams that we had talked to Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, you know, hey, if, if, if this happens or if our guy's there, uh, you know, this is what it would look like. This is what we'd be interested in. Okay, all right, I'll, you know, we'll see what happens. And, and so then when number two did come off the board, um, you know, there were some teams that weren't interested anymore in coming up to number three. There were some teams that were still interested in coming to number three. But there was no at no time was there uh, we weren't starting from zero. We we kind of had a ballpark of what we were trying to do, and you know ultimately we were able to work through and, and come up with a deal that worked. So we're watching the draft, and it feels like the trade is made as we're coming down to the wire. Was it like that for you in the room, or was it calm? Were the conversations very typical of what you expected, and it just took time to kind of get it? to the league so they could announce it um i would say it did it did come down that the time was taken down and that was a product of um you know when when the number two pick when the number two pick goes in the clock starts immediately right so that there's no lag to hey let's walk up there and announce it like it it's it's going and so there's some time to hey we got to check back with all the teams that we've had discussions with Hey, are you still interested? No. Are you still interested? Yes. And then so you go down the line, and so then you go through that process. All right, so now we're down to X number of teams that are interested in coming up. Okay, so this team, we know that this team was here on the deal. This team was here on the deal. Okay, which one do we like better out of the two? All right, we like this one. Let's go back and see if we can talk. And so as we were going through that, um, you know, it, it helped <clears throat> that I, I have a personal relationship with, uh, with Nick Casario in Houston. Um, have a lot of respect for Nick as a as a person. He's been a mentor to me. He's been a friend to me. Our families are close. Um, you know, I say that other than to say just the conversation was easy between Nick and I. And, um, you know, so it, it got to a point where, hey, you know, this is this is what we're offering. And, you know, ah, Nick, I, I need it to include this. And then Nick can tell me, yeah, you know what, I'm not doing that. And so, I don't take offense to that. I know Nick. I, I have that relationship with Nick, and he can tell me, "No, I'm not doing that." And so, eventually, there was some back and forth there, and the talk, clock's going, the clock's going, and I think it was around I don't know two and a half minutes maybe, um, where you know we we got the got the couple deals written up on the board and a couple teams, and so then, uh, okay, Nick, I think we're at a spot where we're close here. It's this and this for this, this and this. Uh, are, are you in? Yep, I'm in. I'm in. Okay, great. Call it in. And so at two, two and a half minutes, we both hang up the phone and our cap guy, Matt Harris, then has to call the league and repeat the trade terms to them. On Nick's end, their cap guy or whoever is handling trades for them has to call the, has to call the league and turn their pick in or turn, turn their, the terms of the trade. We both have to say the exact same trade so the league knows that nobody's trying to pull something here. <laughs> and then so once that happens, the trade becomes official and now Houston's got to take another step and call the player, in this case Will Anderson, get him on the phone and make sure he's okay. And so all that happened, I would say, give or take, in the span of two, two and a half minutes. Oh, so, oh my goodness! <laughs> it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was intense. It was good, but again, I, I would have to go back and look at the tape. I, I don't, I don't think anybody in our room was panicking. I would, you know, football people always got to go back and look at the tape. Sure, so, right. But I think, you know, I think again, I think we had a plan, and, and the time was ticking, and time was of the essence, and. 
But, you know, we were able to, to finally get and push it across the goal line. First of all, it's fascinating. And I think for the people that are listening to this, that, that gives them some inside knowledge as to what it's like. And there's a lot of stuff you said there that I didn't know. I didn't know that you have to actually get Will Anderson, the player that's going to get picked, on the phone to let him know exactly what's going on. Sure. I didn't know how that information was relayed mm-hmm. to a guy, hey, you're going to get picked. But the team that is picking at number three is no longer picking at number three. Correct. Yep. And that's and and really, we are ahead of... We are what you guys are watching on TV. We're ahead of that, and so, you know, maybe it was different for Will being in the green room, but for for most guys, like they they they're sitting there watching on TV, and we we're probably like two picks ahead of them. So we call somebody and tell them, hey, we're gonna, you know, your your name's gonna be coming across here. It's gonna be in a few minutes. So there sure. is a little bit of a lag there. Was Paris Johnson always the guy? Meaning. If you had to pick him at three, would you have? And if so, you know him being the guy for you, when did you know? When did you guys make the decision, hey, this is the guy we want? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, we had, I think we had multiple options at various points. I mean, I think Paris was in the discussion, um, you know, wherever we were going to end up picking. Um, you know, I think for me personally, uh, we, we, did, we spent a lot of time with Paris starting at the Combine with him. We had a formal interview with him there. He was a very impressive kid there. But really what solidified it for me is when, he, when Paris came in for his 30 visit and he got, we got a chance to spend the entire day with him and just to see the type of kid that he was. And, and really those 30 visits have nothing to do with his ability on the field. It's all about the person and how he interacts and, and how smart is he and, and how mature and dependable is he. And so – my meeting with Paris, um, my meeting with all the prospects is really at the end of the day after we spent, you know, kind of put them through the ringer and gone through things. And my meeting with Paris with that was at the end of the day. And, you know, when by the time my meeting with him was done, uh, he walked out and, and I knew that, that, that Paris was made up of the type of stuff that, that we would want to add to our program. And, you know, you, there's, but there's a lot of people that you can say that about. And so, Sure, I hope that we would get a chance to add Paris, and um, you know, ultimately we did, so and we were happy with that. So you trade down, and then you trade back up, obviously, to make the selection at six to get Paris. How did you know when to move back up? Did you know when you made the trade with Houston, hey, we're going to move back up? Part of this deal is we're going to use what we just got or some of the other picks we have to move back up, and when did you pull that trigger? Yeah, that was, that was definitely um, – a, a part of any of our trade down discussions is that we wanted any any trade where we were bouncing back or moving back we wanted to have enough currency in that trade to claw back up but still come out net positive on the first trade and so didn't know if we were going to be able to pull that off like that all sounds great but you need you need the other side of the trade to work out as well and so you know, as we were talking through the scenarios leading up to the week, we knew that, hey, if the further you jump back up, it's going to cost more. And so, you know, so that, those were things that, that we had considered. We were, we were ready. At, we made several calls. As soon as we went back to number 12, we immediately made, started making calls at, at various levels. Um, and, you know, we had to wait for, what, the number, the number four pick to, to go went across. And so then uh, we were making calls, and finally we we came to a team that was willing to or that was willing to take the deal that we were offering, and um, and then we just went ahead and made that move. Second round, you take B.J. Ojolari from LSU, who um, I did not have LSU this year, but had them two years ago. So a little familiar with him, familiar with his brother. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think he can be? I think there were some people. You know, it, Look, you guys got praised by everybody in the media for the moves you made. There were some people, I just remember at the time seeing it, they were a little surprised at the pick. What what do you think BJ can be, and why did you guys take him at that spot? Yeah, sure. So, you know, with, with BJ, we saw, you know, a player that has played at a high level at a, in the, one of the, the best conference in the, in the country, the SEC. Um, we see a guy that has a good get off. He's he's fast off the edge. He can bend. He can. He's got a good mix of, of speed to power, of quickness, of counter moves. Um, you know, and the the thing that the thing that um, really impressed us about BJ is not only meeting with him at the combine, but then also, you know, BJ wears the number eighteen jersey at LSU, and the number eighteen jersey is a, you know, it's a pretty big honor that they give out. That the uh, the staff, the coaches there, they vote on and. 
and really that's given to a player that exhibits the top program characteristics. Not not necessarily the best player, but the best the guy that works hard, does things right, that goes about things the right way. And that that was really important to us. So, you know, not only BJ's ability on the field to rush the passer, to set the edge, uh, to do multiple things in our defense, but also the makeup of BJ was really attractive to us at that point. John Gaines, you guys take in the fourth round. How important was it for you to really address the offensive line in this draft? Yeah, and I think I think line of scrimmage players are, are always going to be important to us. You know, I think I think the game the game starts up there um, on both sides of the ball, and you know, so I think I think that was definitely an area um, that that we wanted to address. Um, you know, with John, it, 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 an in, interesting guy. You know, played played mainly guard at UCLA, but also saw time at center. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when when he went to the uh, the All Star game, he 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 played at the East West uh, All Star game that was in Vegas. He he worked even more so at center. So you know, those interior guys that that have that versatility to play multiple positions that's always going to be intriguing. And then our ability to meet with him, our scouts to meet with him in, in Las Vegas, and then. Also, for us to continue the process through the, from the combine through the um, through the Zoom process, um, you know, Zoom has, has allowed us to to reach out and and just logistically be more uh, efficient with our time. But John did an extremely good job with our, our coaches on the Zoom. Just liked uh, his makeup and his intellect and his ability to handle handle the center position, handle the guard position. Um, you know, so that was attractive about adding John to our group. So you look at the quarterback room. Look, no, nobody in the NFL is like Kyler, but you know Colt and Kyler are pretty different. They're they're on different ends of the spectrum. Where where do you think Clayton Tune, who you guys took in the fifth round from Houston, wh- where does he fit there? What did you guys see in him that you think you know at some point if we had to play this kid, we think he could go in and and win? For yeah, us? yeah. I mean, and we'll we'll see how that all shakes out. I mean, we got a, we got a long way to go here. Sure. Um, we got to get Clayton here and and you know get him get him uh, in doctrine to our offense and, and get him in the group. But, you know, with Clayton, we, it, we did have an interesting perspective with him. Um, you know, our, he, he was a participant down at the Senior Bowl this year. And um, at the time, our, who are our current quarterback coach now, Izzy Wolfork, was with Cleveland at the time. And he had a chance to coach down in the Senior Bowl. And um, one of his, Clayton was on his team. So we had, we had a positive impression. Uh, Izzy, Izzy talked very highly of Clayton coming out of there. And you know Clayton was a highly productive player, and you know I think um, with a guy like Clayton, you know he, he's put up good passing numbers, and, and he's obviously got uh, throwing talent, but it's he, he's also got good athleticism for a, for a bigger quarterback. I mean he ran well at the combine. Um, he ran for I want to say over 500 yards this year in Houston's offense, and so you know I think he he does bring some versatility that he's not just a um, he's just not a pocket passer that he can do some things outside the pocket, play extension. Um, some RPO, RPO type stuff. So we're excited about adding him to our group, and, and we'll see where that shakes out. Just a few more rapid fire. We'll, we'll get you out of here. I really appreciate the time, Monty. Um, Kyler's recovery. Do you guys have a sense yet of when Kyler's going to be available to play? Yeah, I mean, Kyler's here every day. Kyler's grinding. He's working hard. He's getting better. He's improving every day. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have a timeline. I don't have an update on that. You know, Kyler is – we're, we're we're gonna put him out there when he's ready and he'll um, he's doing everything he can now he's in meetings he's learning he's trying to take in the new offense and and doing what he can on that front um, he just can't be out on the field right now and he's is just physically not ready to do that but when he I know he's doing everything he can and when he's ready we'll get him out there and we're excited to get him back out there this obviously is not the first time that you've been part of an organization where you've got veteran players that are unhappy. Uh, they either want to be traded or they want a contract extension, or you've got players like D-Hop that have a huge cap number. I'm talking about Buddha and D-Hop in particular. Now that you're in the chair and you're making the call, how have you managed those requests slash situations? Yeah, and I think the key to, to, to both those situations is communication. And both, both D-Hop and Buddha have been great with communicating with me back and forth um, with their, you know, their representation. So I think you know understanding that that players have opinions and ideas and and things that go through their head. Hey, that's that's human nature. We all have that. That that happens for all of us. But I think just continuing to have those conversations and and keeping them informed in in our thought process and and the things that we have going on here. I mean, there's it's it's exciting here right now. There's a, there's a good energy in the building and and um, 
you know, I think the guys that are here that have been working are, are seeing that and seeing some of the things that we're doing and, and some of the changes that we made. So, so we're excited about that, and I think we're just going to continue to keep those lines of communication open. All right, last one. Um, Isaiah Simmons, you guys deciding not to pick up the option. What all went into that? Choice. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I think I think those are discussions. You know, I, I I wouldn't read anything other than you know that that just probably wasn't the best decision for us to do right now, just as as a team. Um, you know, we're excited about working with Isaiah. We and we think he's extremely talented and has a lot to offer versatility in our defense. Um, but just right now, I think that that the decision to not pick up that option right now is just probably the best for the team right now. Hey, man, I really appreciate this. I think if you're a, a Cardinal fan, you got a lot out of this, and, and you get to know Monty Awesome Ford a little bit more. So appreciate you stopping by, man. Thank Dave, you. thanks for the time. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Thank you. you bet.